everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the Cube One, yet another Kubernetes cluster management tool talk. So I'm Marco Mulrinic, a software developer at Lutzi and a computer science student at the University of Belgrade. I am one of the Cube One core main interns, and you maybe know me as contributor to many other projects such as Kubernetes, Cluster API, and Cluster API provided for DigitalOcean, Cubicorn. You can find me on Twitter, GitHub, Kubernetes Slack as xmudri. And I have prepared the GitHub gist with links to slides and some of the resources I will present at this talk. So if you want, go ahead and take a picture of the link or write it down. Okay, so let's start. Well, we did a thing, and if you follow it, Lutzi and me or some of other core maintenance of Cube One, you had a chance to see that we built a yet another Kubernetes cluster lifecycle management tool. And we called it Cube One. You can find it on our GitHub. It is open source tool, and so basically today, we are going to see what Cubon is and why we built it, how it works, but we are going to focus on how it really works, how it a deep dive into architecture, and to see how it looks like to build a cluster management tool nowadays. <coughs> Let's start with a quick introduction to Cube One. Cube One is an open source tool for managing Kubernetes cluster lifecycle. It provisions a digital Kubernetes, keeps your cluster up to date, and if needed, unprovisions it. It supports it to work on any cloud provider, on on premises, and on bare metal. And it is focused on highly available cluster with Kubernetes 1.13 and newer supported. Among so many awesome cluster management tools, we are often asked why we built Cubone and why is Cubone decide so different than any other tool? Well, we had some vision, and the first point is that we needed a tool that we can bring a single cluster using a single command quickly so we can run our managed solution called Kubernetes, and we want just something like Cubone install cluster.yaml. <coughs> But that's not only the point. We wanted to apply some of the lesson learners managing workload to managing cluster. And most important, we wanted to do it declaratively to define all clusters in a form of manifest. Later on, we'll see why is that important. Besides that, we wanted to utilize the lab test technologies and tools, and we wanted to empower the user to easily configure the cluster however they want, or at least almost however they want, because if you know that some configuration is going to break the cluster, we should try to warn users. We can't prevent them if they really want, but we should at least warn that, okay, this is not going to work, you should not really go ahead, but if you want, we can stop you. So how it works? Well, we use kubeadm to provision control plane nodes and run upgrades, but for Working nodes, we use cluster APR, actually machine controller, which is our open source cluster API implementation. We declarative represents all cluster, which brings that a desired cluster is defined in just a few lines of YAML. Declarative approach brings reproducibility because you can take your manifest, share it with your colleagues, put in, in Git version control system you use, and you can just use the same manifest to create the same cluster however times you want. But beside that, you describe what you want, and the tool or controller do the job for you and gives you a cluster. That manifest can look like simple as this. Like the first one is in case we use integration with Terraform that is going to source all information. But in case you don't use Terraform, you can define it like in the manifest on the right side, where we define version, cloud provider, and then we have information about hosts. Some information are omitted, so the manifest can fit in this slide. 
but you can provide like private addresses, SSH information, and then API endpoint that is usually just a load balancer that you're going to access the control plane. And with that in place, you either use Kubon install with Terraform integration or just a Kubon install with Manifest. When you install a cluster using Cube One, we provide a ready to use cluster. With ready to use, we mean that we deploy CNI plugin, currently supported in case of Cube One, VivNet and Kernel, and we create a working nodes. But we also support configure various features like pod security policy to additionally secure a cluster, dynamic audit log backend, metric server, and more. And one of the important features is ability to integrate with infrastructure provisioning tools. Out of box, you can integrate with Terraform. We'll see about that in a quick demo. But you can also integrate with Ansible by making a template that is going to fill all information and put it to Cube One or with CloudFormation and other infrastructure provisioning tools you like and use already. So let's go to the quick, okay, we have to close this. Okay, so what do we have? Okay, you see? Just back it at the beginning. <coughs> so what we have actually done. In this quick demo, let's see, is it going to start? Yeah, it is. So we have defined a Terraform configuration, like number of control plane nodes and so on. We probably on click this infrastructure using Terraform. In your case, you can use any other tool. We, d we decided to use Terraform because it is one of the most popular solutions out there. And when you have infrastructure, we save the Terraform state output. In case of Cube it is important to note that the output state must follow the template used here so Cube can parse it. And we create the configuration manifest like we have seen. And run Cube install. So now that takes like three or five minutes or 10, depending on the cloud provider or the speed of the API, is it on bare metal, on premises and so on. This is a little bit speed up, so we don't lose a lot of time on that. And yeah, we just can use the cluster after that. And today we are going to see how that actually works under the hood and what is happening when we run that Cube on install and what tool actually involves around that. Now we can get back to slides. Okay, just a moment. Okay, so building a cluster management tool. Just to grab. So what are some fundamental operations when it is, comes down to cluster lifecycle operations? So most important, of course, is installing the cluster. Then we should provide upgrades because in Kubernetes, new versions are there often, like every three months, and patch versions are there often the that. So users need to be able to upgrade fast, especially when there is some security release or something like that. And beside upgrading, you usually want to destroy or unprovisioned the clusters, so it is usually included as fundamental. And optionally, this of course can be studied with some additional operation like cluster repair, or maybe reconciling process, so you have all operations as a one comment. And we are going to start with the first one, and it is installing the cluster. Installing the cluster usually involves some of the following tasks. So, provisioning the infrastructure, creating the nodes, and backing load balancers, variables, where are you going to run Kubernetes. Then, installing dependencies, binaries, and preparing the instances, like configuring Docker, networking, if everything needed. Then, the most important provisioning Kubernetes, 
deploying selected components like CNI or if you are allowing users to choose like metric server and more. And at the end, create working nodes so you can actually deploy the workload and get started using cluster. But we have seen that there is a lot of tasks there. And do we really have to do that ourselves and manually? Well, we don't. And usually we don't want to do that because if there is a tool that it does it well, we often want to reuse it. So it may be better tested and you prevent some potential errors that may be hard to debug and find out. And we usually call such tools or products sub building blocks that we use in our tool to provide a better experience of some feature. And we are going to start with the first one. And this is provisioning the infrastructure. And so what we have? Infrastructure can be provisioned by implementing an API or abstraction in your tool. And many providers ship libraries that make this possible and easier. But also an option is to use an external tool, like we have seen in the demo, Terraform, Ansible, or anything else you like. But each of these has some positive and negative side that must be considered before making a choose, do we want to go with one or another? In case of implementing yourself an API, you get to do everything using a single tool. So when your user downloads a tool, they can just define infrastructure and everything in probably one manifest, and that tool is going to bring that up, no dependency on other tools, no worries, is other tool going to break? Do they know to use such tool? And if you do it right, and you probably want to do it that way because to make it possible to use all that information and to actually interact with the API, you should have some abstraction at the top of all other APIs. This is important if you support multiple providers and on bare metal and so on because every provider has their own API. So at the top of all providers' APIs, you should have some your own API that is abstracting all others and interacting with them. One example of that API that you can take a look if you're interested is Cubicorn. It basically has an API at the top of all others and just abstracting that. And one of other positive stuff is that it provides user a same default. Like if you expecting user to get started with Kubernetes, user needs to know what infrastructure they need to create. Like how, how the firewall should be configured, how the load balancer should be configured, what instances options should be enabled. And if you provide some way to do it with your tool, you probably can give some defaults so it is easier to get started. Often even using external tools, this can be confusing to use if you don't provide some examples to get started. But as we said, there are some negative sides. And the first one is that providing an API and an abstraction can get hard, especially if you support multiple cloud providers that because all of them have different libraries that may work like you expect or not. And it gets even worse when you start supporting on on-premises and bare metal because they work differently than cloud. And maybe more important, than that is that users have to trust your tool. It is, if your some company already uses like Terraform and any other tool and they got used to it, the developers already trust it, it can take some time until you make them use your tool and show them that your tool actually works. And even that, there is a need to migrate the existing infrastructure to your new API, and that can take a lot of time. And as another option is that we can use just an external tool. And one of the positive sides there is, as I said, users just can continue using what they already got used to. And there is no need to migrate or do any changes to the workflow. You can just create infrastructure with one tool and connect two tools and just use them like that. And from developer side, you just save your time because you don't need to learn how all the API works and libraries work, and you don't need to spend time maintaining your own API abstraction and making them work with all other providers. 
but there comes the problem with communication, because if you're, you probably want to make your tool provide, be able to source information from the tool external you're using for infrastructure. Now, that depends on how the API works for that tool and what is their format of outsourcing, but this is some of thing you need to pay attention to. And using external tool for managing infrastructure can increase the complexity of the tool that manages the cluster lifecycle. Like, for example, when you're building a tool that is a little bit easier, that is not really noticeable, but like if you want to build a controller, like a cluster API controller, it gets almost impossible because it usually runs in the cluster, and this is, you can't really use Terraform or something like that. Actually, you can, but there is a problem with security and other stuff. And we come to the second task, and this is installing dependencies in binaries. Depending on solution you use for provisioning Kubernetes, you need to install your dependencies and binaries in advance, like, if you use kubeadm that we are going to see, it just provisions the Kubernetes, so you have to provide kubelet and all that before. And with that task, we usually include installing CRI, like container runtime interface like Docker, needed dependencies to run Kubernetes, and then kubeadm and if you use it, or kubelet, and then configuring like operating system, networking, and so on. But in most of cases, this has to be done currently manually because there is not some library that helps to outsource that part, but one of the is idea of what some tools are doing is using image stamping, so you just prepare some images and if your provider supports it, like MEI on Amazon, you can just build the image, upload and reuse it without needing to prepare infrastructure each time. And now, the most important part is provisioning Kubernetes. The most simplest way to do it is to actually use kubeadm, and from the kubeadm documentation, kubeadm helps you bootstrap a minimum viable Kubernetes cluster that conforms to best practices. Basically, kubeadm already has everything you need to get started with Kubernetes to build your cluster that is going to pass most of the conformance tests, basic out of box, it should pass all of them, but now that may depend on the, how you set up the instance, as I said, is everything correctly. It is developed and an official tool by Kubernetes and Kubernetes C cluster lifecycle. It reached global availability in Kubernetes 1.13 and is considered production ready, but one of the important features, it supports many features of the Kubernetes, like PSP, dynamic audit backlog. You can configure almost everything with kubeadm using kubeadm configuration manifest. Some of the features, it includes provisioning, upgrading, and done provisioning the cluster. It, with kubeadm, you can use the same step regardless of provider and architecture. And this is important. If you want to have a tool that supports many providers, you probably don't want to care about how you want to run some steps to provision Kubernetes. You want to use some tool that is going to take care of that. You need probably to take care of configuration. Some providers require additional configuration and most fragile part is networking because some providers have one interface, some two you need to take care where you want to expose Kubernetes, what you want to use for etcd, and so on. It works with both single control plane setups and highly available setups with multiple control planes. It can manage work and nodes as well. This is something we probably don't want to do with kubeadm out of box, and we are going to see an alternative solution. A cluster provision with kubeadm passes conformance tests, and kubeadm behaves as a building block. How is the workflow? So basically, you install dependencies. This is a task we mentioned before that. You generate the kubeadm configuration manifest, and this is manifest that defines the cluster. How is it provisioned? What version are you going to use? What features are you going to enable? And to see and get idea how it works, 
let's see just a quick cluster. Okay, it's here. So how it works like and looks like. So this is a little bit bigger file. It includes a lot of details. Now, some of the stuff here is included like this that should not be due to engine we use for parsing YAML, but basically it includes IP addresses, API endpoints, node IP addresses, and so on. As you can see, it is a little bit bigger file, so you probably want, with your tool, to generate it yourself, so your user doesn't need to do it manually because it takes a lot of time and you can easily make some mistake if you're doing it manually. So some tool that is going to create it is mostly queried. And now, but beside that, for highly available setups, it gets a little bit more complicated because you also have to take care of certificates and psych them and configuration files between all counterplay nodes. And when you have the kubeadm configuration manifest, it gets easy. You just run kubeadm init and kubeadm join for other counterplay nodes. And this can be done using cloud init. There is even models for cloud inited kubeadm that you can find on the internet or just run it over SSH. And then we have to deploy the selected components. So in this case, this is usually CNI, machine controller, and PSP, metric server, and so on. Usually, you can just use kubectl apply, but if you're using a tool and it is written in Go, what you can take a look at is client Go. Basically, you just pull the cube config file from one of the counterplay nodes, and then use it to build the client set, and just apply your manifest in form of Go structures to your cluster. And the last test to actually be able to use your working nodes is to, to use your cluster is to create working nodes where you run the workload. And as we said, kubeadm is able to handle working nodes just like control plane nodes. You generate the manifest, tell that it is a working node, then run kubeadm join, and that's it. You have a control plane uh, working node. But it's complicated. We don't want to do it that way. We want to provide some way so users can easily scale because working nodes is something that you are changing frequently. You remove or add a new ones, change something, and so on. So we want to be able to accomplish to that need so developers and operators can just easily do it. And so at the end, we probably want to use something like kubectl scale node deployment. This is a node deployment object that we are going to see a little bit later around some name and say replicas five. And let's say that it was free before and it's going to join two more nodes to a cluster. And the project that allows us to do this is Cluster API. A Cluster API is another official project of Kubernetes C cluster lifecycle that brings decorative Kubernetes style API for cluster creation, configuration, and management. But Cluster API is course currently considered as an alpha project. Some features may be missing or are work in progress, and it makes it hard to use it to manage clusters and control plane nodes, so we decided to build a tool that does it and use cluster API for more working nodes. There is a lot of progress recently. There have a plans how to improve that and how to make cluster API work actually for Control place said cluster definition, and if you're interested in that, you should keep a look at it and see how is it going, and can we reuse some of that parts or help on it. How cluster API works? Basically, it is not really an API or just an API. It provides API for clusters that is work in progress and for machines that is considered alpha, but is much more stable and can be used to manage machines. On a cluster, we run a CRD controller that watches the requisite cluster API resources. In case of Kubeone, we use a Kubernetes machine controller, which is a free and open source cluster API controller. 
In the GIS that I showed a link at the beginning, there is a link for it and you can find out it and learn more about it. And on supported providers, we automatically deploy and manage working nodes using machine controller. The workflow in this case is that we deploy a cluster API controller on the cluster, like in our case it's machine controller. We create a machine deployment object, and when machine deployment object is created, the controller sees it and creates other needed objects and bring us machines. We need to wait a some moments for nodes to appear, but after they are there, the cluster is ready to be used. Machine deployment object works like deployment object. When you create a machine set, it creates the, ma when you create a machine deployment, it, the controller creates machine set, which creates the appropriate number of machine objects. And in the machine deployment, you have everything needed to provision a work in order to join it a cluster, like information about the infrastructure provider uh, pointed to credential, is it secret or whatever, information needed, like Kubernetes version, and so on. And a quick diagram that shows the, how it works, basically, we have at the top machine deployment, and it is basically just like deployment that we have got used to it, but it is managing machines instead. And this is everything that user needs to create. When you create it, you get machine set, similar to replica set, just again, it is about machines, and for each replica you have, controller creates machine, like if you have three replicas, you're going to get three machines, and machine is basically similar to pod, that is our workload. And this is what we have from the installing the cluster part. So basically, in most of cases, you can use some another tool as the building blocks. There is some parts that you need to do it yourself, but currently there's a lot of tools that you can use to get started. But this is not everything. We also have to upgrade the cluster once after some time. But this is nothing to worry about because the upgrade process is similar to installation process in case we use kubeadm for example. And in case of Cube 1, we upgrade control plane nodes in place. That means that over SSH, we run kubeadm upgrade, upgrade binaries needed, upgrade components, and then continue using the cluster. The reason for in place rather than like rolling out control place as well is because that this is not going to work for all providers. For cloud, yes, it is going to work. But for bare metal, that depends a lot on the setup and what is running there. So we decided just to have a universal solution. This is in place. But for working nodes, as we manage them using machine controller and machine deployment objects, we just roll out. And this is done by editing the machine deployment object to increase the version. And controller automatically creates a new machine set object and starts adding a new machine, when it joins the cluster, the old one is deleted, and now that depends on the configuration, how you define and how you match to have available nodes, but usually this is how it works. And so what do we have? We have upgrading all dependencies and binaries. This is like for install, you use your package manager that depends on the OS, and you just go to upgrade all Kubernetes components. This is easy part because everything you need to run is kubeadm upgrade and provide the configuration file similar to the configuration used for installing. Then deploy the components like CNI, machine controller, or whatever you deployed when creating a cluster. And roll out the working nodes. And this is basically it from the upgrade perspective. Like, it is, you can, in most of cases, reuse the steps you use it for install, just use like upgrade for kubeadm and so on. And one more fundamental operation we left is destroying the cluster. Now, this depends on the, uh, on the solution you choose it for infrastructure. 
if you don't manage infrastructure yourself, like use Terraform, you can unprovision it and leave the infrastructure to be destroyed by the user. This is a good idea because in some of cases, you can reuse that to just create another cluster on the same infrastructure. There's some things to pay attention to, like just remove all packages. But if you manage the clusters, infrastructure as a gear tool, you can just destroy the infrastructure and not a lot of things to care about. And the workflow is basically, don't forget to remove all machine deployment, machine set, and machine objects. So working nodes disappear. Run cube ADM reset. Just make sure to wait for machines to be gone because uh, for machines to be gone, controller needs to need still to be running to make sure there doesn't exist anymore. And the cube ADM reset command is basically reverse everything that is done by init and join commands of cube ADM. And optionally remove the Kubernetes binaries and dependencies. And this is a really important if you want to reuse the infrastructure. Like if you want to downgrade and you leave Kubelet to some newer version, your cluster is probably going to misbehave. And for the end, well, we basically come to the end. And so what we have learned, we have quickly seen what is Kubelet, but we've seen how it really works under the hood and what is our main cluster lifecycle operation covered by the tool. And basically, the most important tools that you wanted to see beside Kubon is KubeADM and Cluster API. And once again, here is a link to the slides and other resources. And you can find me on Twitter. And I think like we have five more minutes for some questions.